Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to episode number the Lead to Greatness podcast, where we believe in helping others reach their greatest potential, and together we can change the world. Today on Lead to Greatness, we have Shane Foss. Shane is the CEO of Hooray Health. Today on the podcast, Shane discussed the challenges that he has recently faced as a CEO during a time of uncertainty. He also discussed things that he's doing to transition back from working remotely to working back at the office. Please help me welcome Shane in transitioning to the new normal. This is Cedric Francis, and you're listening to the Lead to Greatness. Uh, I had a great, great family. Um, you know, grew up with my grandfather, you know, one of my best friends, right? Doing everything with him. Your dad's working all the time. And so, uh, you know, he really taught me to socialize with people and how to talk to people and tell stories. And so that was a big part of my life, but uh, found my way down to Texas in the military. And uh, I was in the Air Force and really enjoyed that. That was, um, that was probably a turning point for me professionally because it really gave me a lot of uh, a lot of guidance and really gave me you know really a focus or you know some discipline in what I really wanted to do and what I really enjoyed was the structure right so you had a hierarchy and you know you you had obviously your officer officer NCO you know enlisted hierarchy but even in your different disciplines there was a hierarchy which was really nice because you always had somebody there that was it seemed responsible for what you were doing and you were constantly learning and so when we d- would do our medical readiness training out in the middle of you know West Texas out in the blazing sun mm. I was I was on a surgical team so we had our operating room and we actually went out with the army and uh, what was really interesting to me was you know, you always start off for whatever reason, this, this independent mindset, I'm out here, hey, look, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to survive, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do what I have to do to do, you know, to be successful. But then when you're out there, and all of a sudden, you've got, you know, obviously, these were simulated, but dead bodies everywhere, injured people. And now all of a sudden, you know, I can't pick you up, you're a 225 pound guy, I cannot pick you up by myself and carry you a mile, right. And so, the teamwork, you know, it was very humbling in the sense that, you know, working with other people to, you know, hey, look, we got to make this decision. This is, uh, you know, this is, this is from a triage standpoint, this guy's not going to make it. Let's get this, this girl, get her over to surgery, you know, and so making those decisions and, you know, working with the team. And, and uh, I, I thought that was, for me, I thought that was really um, uh, a great experience because, you know, even if you're on a basketball, right, you're on a basketball team, which is what I grew up playing, mm-hmm. you're, you know, you've got the team aspect, but there's an individual aspect. Mm-hmm. But in the military, it seemed like everywhere we, you know, everything that we were doing, we were always depending on somebody else, one way or the other to get stuff done. Uh, military, uh, fortunately, uh, taught us teamwork as well. So when you were in the Air Force, was you in, you know, medical? What was yeah, so I, I was what they called a scrub tech. Okay. And uh, so I was a surgical technologist. And so what I did was I assisted surgeons during surgery. Mm. And so I was uh, very lucky to be stationed at Lackland Air Force Base, which is where we have our basic training. But there's a uh, subset of it called uh, Wilford Hall, which was the Air Force's largest hospital at the time. And so we we had a training uh, program there for residents. And, and so we uh, we did everything. You know, we did complex total joints. We did you know, um, oncology, we did trauma, we did everything. And so I really had a um, open heart. I had a great opportunity to learn. And what was great was I had residents that were coming in that were, you know, didn't know really anything about surgery. And so they were always getting taught. So I'm a constant learner. So I was, that was wonderful for me. So I just sat back and listened and, and, you know, would absorb everything that the the faculty was teaching them. And so it was, uh, yeah, it was just a great experience. That's perfect. So as far as the help, so the military, was that the first entry to the health industry? Yes. What was interesting is I, I don't really, none, nobody in my family has any healthcare experience. So I was never exposed to it. And so um, I remember when I went down to the recruiter, it was, you know, funny story. I, um, I went down to the recruiter. I made the, the decision that I was joining the military. And um, 
college just wasn't, I just wasn't mature enough. And I just, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I went down and it was at lunch and the Navy recruiter was at lunch. So the Air Force recruiter was standing right there. Hey, come talk to me. So I go and I talk to the Air Force <laughs> recruiter and, um, you know, we started talking and I, he goes, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I said, you know, look, I'm curious, give me some options. And we started talking. He goes, one of my best friends was a, was a uh, surgical technologist. This is what they did. I said, that sounds cool. <laughs> and so I did it. And the second I got into it, I just really, you know, I just blossomed. I mean, I just literally absorbed everything and I learned everything and I wanted to learn more. And, you know, and honestly, I, I wanted to become a doctor. So I worked, um, it was really, and Wilford Hall was a great place to be because we worked weekend nights. We were a level one trauma center. So I worked 16 hour shift Friday night and Saturday night shift. And then I worked eight hours on Sunday night. And then I went to school full time during the week at Incarnate Word, 18 credits a semester and got my degree, you know, right before I got out of the military. And so, you know, and I wanted to go to medical school and um, my wife at the time, she got out, she graduated a year before me and got accepted to medical school. And so we, uh, we'd been married for, I guess, a year or so. And then, you know, we got the, the blessing that uh, our, you know, she was pregnant with our son. And so she, um, you know, we had, we had our son and I was like, well, somebody's got to work. And so I started working for J and J uh, and in uh, medical device sales and um, never looked back. It's, you know, been a great, great experience, great life. And I don't regret a thing. So you, so you got into sales going from the uh, medical den going into medical sales. What was the correlation with that? And how did that work out to where you're on that? So it worked out really well. So because I was in surgery, um, we were selling orthopedic medical device. So total knees, total hips, um, trauma, you know, if you break your leg, they have pins and screws and rods, they call them. And so I, you know, I was, I was very comfortable. That was my space. And so, um, and I knew it very, very well. And so uh, when I started selling, I did really well. And, uh, you know, growing up with my grandfather, I, you know, I was never met a stranger. So I was always able to, you know, connect with people. And um, so I ended up doing really well in medical device sales. I was in the operating room, which was, you know, for me, you know, that, you know, in, being in scrubs and uh, in surgical, you know, OR, I, I mean, that's my home. And so um, did really well. And so I, I was there for five years. And then I was with another company called Stryker Orthopedics. And that's where professionally, you know, they were they've been the best organization I've ever worked with. And they're a wonderful company, still are a wonderful company, Stryker Orthopedics. And they, you know, they they spend a lot of time and money on developing you as a as a leader, a business leader. And so I learned so much. They paid for my MBA at Rice. I mean, they just, you know, and I worked with the best people. And so it was a it was a really good experience for me. Um, very challenging. Seems like everywhere I always went, I kind of I got the um, the area that was underperforming and had been underperforming for a while. And, you know, and but for me, always a new challenge. I always entered, really enjoyed it. So just always grew and did better. That's, that's awesome. So you learn teamwork in the team environment and then you got into sales and you were a great salesman. And then you begin to, you know, uh, business leadership. Mm -hmm. And so you're developing in all these different areas. You, you, you're growing and you're developing. What are the critical components of building the right team? I will tell you it's time and energy and, uh, and it's making mistakes. Hmm. I think, you know, first and foremost, you need to identify what you need, you know, in, in, a, in a job description. Okay. So in other words, when you're looking for high, high performing salespeople, you know, you don't go look in typically looking for an accountant, right? And, and that is not a derogatory statement towards accounting. It is just the exact opposite. If I need, if I need somebody in accounting, I am not looking at my salespeople, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I think that's part of it. I think that's a big mistake a lot of people make is that they don't really identify first what they're looking for and what they need. And what'll happen is you'll get the wrong person in there. And then you're like, man, I really needed X or Y. So I think that's, that's one of the things. I think the other thing is patience. And patience means a couple of things. First of all, in the interview process, it's really being disciplined at, you know, interviewing and finding um, the right person. So in other words, it's not, if you interview five people for a key role, I, you've, 
you have wasted your time because there is no way you're finding the right person in five people. And it's so funny because, wow. you know, my sales team, what we would do is, I mean, we interviewed minimum of 20 for a spot in our, in our sales team. And what was really interesting was I would get, I would do round robin. So once I would kind of get the, the right people, I would bring in my sales team and then they would interview. And it was so interesting because they would, they would look at the first group we brought in and they're like, oh my gosh, this is it. And then, then when we brought in the second group, they're like, wow, these guys are so much better. And I said, exactly. If you wouldn't have taken the time to look at the second group, right, you would have settled for somebody in the first group. And, you know, it's, um, so I think patience and, and discipline in your, um, you know, taking the time to really uh, interview, because it, it really is, I, that's your most important job. And then I think the other part of patience is being honest with yourself when you bring in somebody. Are you taking the time to really teach and, you know, hold them accountable to learn and then to perform and giving them not only the tools, but the time to succeed. You know, it, it's so interesting because when you look at sales in general, sales is a relationship business for the most part and it takes time it, you know you have to break barriers and some you know some sales cycles are longer or you know or even a, it could be accounting or it could be account management any of these but it's all the same in the sense that you know there may be different time um, tables for success but you need to make sure that you're patient and you give them enough time to succeed and that you're you know you're giving them the opportunity because um, people start turning off right away from a, uh, you know, if, if, if you hire them and then you're like beating them down, you know, three weeks later, I mean, putting them on a performance improvement plan. Hey, how do we get you better? How do you know? I mean, it, it's, it's very um, disheartening. Wow. You just touched on something that I believe, and I do want to dig more into this. I want you to talk about in specific, what are some big mistakes, some big mistakes that, you've seen that you may have made or you see companies make with this process? I've made every mistake and I'm going to continue to make mistakes. You know, I, I look at some of the companies that I've, you know, I've worked with in the past where, you know, you're setting unrealistic expectations of people. And if you're, you're setting people up to fail right away. And I think that's the biggest challenge. It's if I set a quota for you for, let's say a million dollars, and I know there's no way on earth, you're going to hit that number. I'm setting you up to fail. But if I think you can hit 50,000 and that's a good mark for the first year, then why am I not setting it $50,000, right? So you can incrementally win and get to, you know, get to where you, you are. And so for me, I think that's the motivation is everything, right? When you, when you, if you build the best team, best team, if the motivation isn't there, and you're demotivating your team on a daily basis, you've completely negated any of the positives to having the good team. Mm -hmm. And so um, I worked with a group, I won't say the company, but I worked with a group that they brought their whole senior management team over from a, a huge world-class organization. And they were the worst human beings on the planet I've ever met. They were impatient. They would call you one day and say, I need, I need your sales report and the, your plan for the rest of the year. Okay. All right. Well, here it is. Here's our plan. You know, we map it out and then they call you a week later. Why haven't you hit your plan? <laughs> That's like, wow. look guys, do you, do you want us to actually actively go out and work or do you want us just to talk about work mm -hmm. and keep reporting? Right. I mean, to me, you know, I, I, it just doesn't make a good environment for anybody. So anyway, and you know, and I, I think ignorance and security, whenever I see organizations that do that, a lot of people in their management, in my opinion, have never sold or been successful in a, in a sales role or in a, in another role, just in general, I just haven't been successful. And, you know, somehow they make it to that position and they're insecure where they're at, you know, so they lash out. Okay. So here we are, you interviewed and now you went through the process and now you have the right team. How do you keep a team focused and motivated in times of uncertainty? Well, uh, communication is the number one way, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, honestly, it's the only way. Yeah. Um, 
you know, accountability is really tricky in certain roles because if there's not easy, easy measurement, you know, sales is easy. If your sales are going down, you're, you know, that's how you, you know, your sales numbers are your accountability. Yeah. But if you're, you know, from a customer service standpoint, if you, depending on the metrics you're tracking and stuff can be more difficult. You know, it, it's um, when everybody went uh, remote, it was communicating, setting up, you know, the regular meetings with everybody still, you know, still making sure like for myself that they knew I was working, that I wasn't playing golf every day, that I was, you know, you know, setting the expectation and setting the tone. Personally, I'm very blessed. I've got the best leadership team I've ever had in my 30 years as a manager. And so how do, how can I support you during, during this time? What do you need? And I think, you know, the other thing is just being realistic with people and, you know, letting them know that you care. I think one of the most underrated feelings or letting them know that they, you care about them, right? I mean, if they call you and they lost a, you know, they lost a loved one or during this time, or, you know, they're scared, or if, you know, they're just not feeling well, you know, um, just checking in on them. Hey, how are you doing today? Right? No, not work. Just how are you doing today? Really goes a long way. And, um, and that is, uh, you know, that's something that is sincere. What we did was we told everybody even, you know, as they're starting to come back, right? Hey, come back in the office starting now when you're ready. But by by July 5th, we want everybody back in the office so we can kind of get business going again, business as usual. Right. And, um, you know, let us know, you know, Long, who's uh, who's our COO, is just a, you know, wonderful human being. But he he sent everybody out a link to get their to get their vaccinations. And, you know, we're you know, we're a big family. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that uh, that's a big part of it. Families fight. Families have disagreements. Family members leave the family, right? And so, you know, as long as you realize that, that's uh, it should be okay. But yeah, that's uh, I mean, yeah. it's it's business as usual, right? From a motivation factor, I think it's just whether we're over the phone or or over Zoom or whether we're you know face to face. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. How is transitioning? Because now you you talked about working remotely, and now you're trying to transition people mm-hmm. back in the office. But uh, transitioning uh, to the remote work, how did that improve your ability to lead? I don't know if it really improved my ability to lead. I think that what it did was it um, it challenged it in the sense that when you have somebody in your office and you're you know you can walk down the hall and talk to them for three minutes, and because what we've done is. Um, we've, we've created this busy work almost, you know, I mean, at one point I literally, you know, I, I, I would block out time on my calendar that said, get crap done because I, you know, my assistant would literally put me back to back, to back, to back, to back zoom meetings all day. Right. If I'm doing that or any of my team is doing that, then what happens is either you're working after hours, right. To get stuff done or you're not getting stuff done. Right. And then if you're on meeting, 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 then how can I ever talk to you? So really did was it made me appreciate the having everybody's beautiful faces in the office where I can see them, you know, on a, on a daily basis. I, I think having a positive attitude about it and just being flexible is, you know, really the, uh, the key to, you know, being successful in that environment. The biggest thing that I've learned um, working remote is making that communication is still key. Appreciation, getting the team together on really a monthly basis as a team outside of work just to get together hey let's go have a drink let's have some you know whether it's dinner or you know whatever we got a we got a social club over here that we can go play pool as a group we can go you know do a bunch of stuff but um you know just getting people out and doing things together and um getting to know people uh as you know personally as opposed to just professionally because i think what covid really you know, what re- that really did was luckily we, um, we were actually hiring during COVID, which made it really interesting. Wow. But, um, but, but what it did was it made it very difficult to really build a deep relationship with, you know, some of your employees in the sense that over Zoom, you know, it's, it's still a pretty sterile environment. Wow. And so, um, you know, so I think my biggest takeaway is making sure that, you know, we take the time, we don't get too busy in the whirlwind, and uh, that we we take time to celebrate as a team and and to uh, get out and have fun. I mean, I, one of our, one of our girls that uh, is our account manager, Brittany, she had her one year anniversary um, maybe a 
three weeks ago. And so we took her out to lunch, big lunch and, you know, had a few drinks and had you know big, big lunch. And it was really nice. It was just, but it was good. We didn't even talk about work. We just talked about family and just talked about everything. And it was really, it was just really nice. So, I mean, I think that, uh, that those are the things I'm looking forward to getting back into, but as a leader, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for me. What, what has been the biggest leadership challenge you face as a CEO? Balancing the investors and balancing uh, expectations. Mm. You know, I think that when you're an entrepreneur and you, and you raise money, um, it, you know, it sounds really sexy and it sounds, you know, wow. But, you know, the reality is it's, um, you know, it's like a marriage. You got to be very selective of who you bring in. You got to be strategic about who you bring in to invest. You know, money is easy to get, right? It's just, but getting the right money is important. And so the, the biggest challenge is balancing between, you know, the expectations of the board and investors and then balancing, you know, what, you know, what you can do with your team and, and, um, and the timing and, you know, how, how hard do you push? How hard do you push your partners? I think, you know, that balance is probably the most difficult thing for me. I think that, um, you know, those are things that keep you up at night, right? Let's, let's talk a little bit about your company. How did, how did you begin that journey? Yeah, sure. So I, um, you know, I was never in health insurance. I, um, but one of my best friends from Stryker called me up and he was a CEO at, uh, he took his first CEO job at a company called employer direct. And, and he, um, he was like, Hey, I could really use your help over here. And, and uh, I was just exiting out of another company. And so the timing was right. And I went and looked at it and it was a, it was a company where they um, basically they provided access to bundled surgical pricing for large self-funded employers. And so it was really interesting. I'd never done it before. So I went over there and we uh, you know, he had to raise money to keep the doors open. It was really tight. It was a lot of fun. I mean, I, you know, it was a great time and, and we ended up selling it 11 months later and uh, they, you know, did very well on that. And so it was, um, it was a really good experience. It really um, piqued my interest in the health benefits space. And so I was uh, consulting for a company for, you know, just in between, you know, what I was going to do. And uh, I had a back issue and I went into an urgent care and I had um, one of the major carriers at the time, I had a $5,000 deductible and I went in and, um, they said it's a $75 copay. And I said, well, Hey, what's the bill going to be? Cause I haven't hit my deductible yet. And they're like, Oh, it's 150 bucks. No problem. So I paid it. Well, so they took an x-ray in my neck. They found what they thought was a little bone spur in there. And they gave me um, two injections, a muscle relaxer and an anti-inflammatory. And so sent me on my way, neither of them helped, but I get an $800 balance bill. And three weeks later, and I called them up. I said, Hey, wait, you guys are in network. I paid $150. And they're like, well, you know, we got carve outs. And, wow. and so, um, you know, so I negotiated it down because it was a carve out. It wasn't a contracted rate, but here's, what's interesting is 64% of millennials, which are, you know, what up to age 40 now, right. Prefer an urgent care retail clinic. They're open seven days a week. They're open until eight o'clock at night. They have x-ray and they have lab on site. You know, you can just walk in and you're talking to a physician unless it's a retail clinic, then you're talking to a nurse practitioner. But the point is, it's very convenient and you don't have to be, you know, if you try to get a PCP, primary care physician now, I mean, it, it's crazy, right? And so, um, so what I did was I went out and I started contracting. I built a national network of retail clinics for a $25 copay and there's no balance bill. Imagine that. So you just pay the 25 bucks and then on the backside, the insurance pays the bill. But what we, what I did was I really focused on lower income, right? Whether it's part-time or full-time hourly or, you know, lower to mid salaries. And what's interesting is, you know, that market has expanded so much, even since I started the company, because, you know, now you're looking at a bronze plan with, you know, $3,500 deductible at 750 bucks a month. Who the heck can afford 750 bucks for a month for, you know, I mean, most people don't even have $400 in their bank account. Right. And so we're not a major medical. What we are, as I call us a minor medical, we, we just take care of physician office visits and labs have an accident policy that's tied to it. And so we have a mobile app to get you to the providers and everything we do, we try to make it easy and affordable. And, you know, um, you know, if, if you can afford major medical, we want you to be on it. 
but unfortunately there's a lot of people I just can't. And, um, so we, uh, yeah, so we, we built a, I mean, a product, literally our product starts at $80. As a matter of fact, we just got a new carrier. It's a little bit less now, but, um, but yeah, so I, you know, I think the goal is just giving people affordable access. You, you know, you just, it's just very frustrating to me because my wife is a provider, a physician. And I know that, you know, as far as physicians go, they don't really understand their billing practices and that there's no malice there, but ignorance, you know, really is not bliss when you're sending people to collections and one in five Americans are sent to collections for a, a medical bill, less than $600 every year. And so, and the number one, number one reason for personal bankruptcy literally is medical bad debt. And so, you know, I just, it, it's just not, it's not part of the credo of, of healthcare and we, we want to do better and we want to help out and, you know, and uh, God willing, we'll get there. That is awesome, Sean. And what should team leads, business owners know when it comes to healthcare? Shop around and understand what you can afford and what your employees can afford. Because, you know, what I see today is there's a lot of companies that have people that are making, you know, the majority of their population is making, you know, 30 to $50,000 a year and they can't afford a $5,000 deductible. So you're basically throwing your money away, offering this plan, you know, they need to look and offer something that's more affordable or, you know, they need to, um, they need to spend more money if they've got it and buy that deductible down for that, uh, that employee and take care of them because it's just what we call functionally uninsured and we see it all the time. And it's honestly, it's, it's, it's kind of a big waste of money. There's so many things that, you know, that you can do, but that, you know, look, we work with a lot of great brokers that are out there, broker consultants that, that provide um, those services that help them, you know, get the cost down and, you know, figure out the most efficient way to, to do that. But, you know, the biggest thing is shop around and, and, you know, talk to your broker consultant and they'll get you, uh, you know, they'll get you in the right uh, plan for your people. Okay. So, so what do, for example, your clients, what do your clients reach out uh, to you guys for, you know, to, to do business? Yeah. So, you know, if you're a, if you're a smaller business or something, you can come directly to us um, at hoorayhealthcare.com, H-O-O-R-A-Y healthcare.com. Uh, some, you know, submit a form and we'll, we'll uh, reach out to you. And uh, I mean, actually any size employer can do that and we can work with your existing broker or we can certainly place you, place you with the broker if you need need one and um, that's how people get a hold of us is that's the best way just go to our website and uh, looking for a referral but you know most of our clients come from uh, broker relationships that we have that are out in the field where they um, you know they look at they're analyzing their business for you know uh, renewal and uh, they uh, they say you know what we need a lower cost option and this is what we're going to do what are some leadership growth tips, tools, and advice you can share with the Lead to Greatness community to help us reach our greatest potential? Make sure that you're reading. You know, um, make sure that you're always reading and growing, uh, expanding your, you know, your capacity, your view of what's going on uh, in the world. I think that, you know, one of the things that poor leaders do is they're they're so myopic in their own, you know, and you know what I do is right. Yeah. They don't listen to anybody else. And then the other thing is just, you know, staying humble. You're going to be a winner today and you may be the best person. <laughs> and tomorrow you could be the worst person and the loser, right? Um, you know, you lose that big client, you can lose the key employee or, you know, or your market goes away, you get legislated out. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think that staying humble and just, you know, really staying curious and, uh, and staying positive uh, has a is really has a big effect on your business and your, and your well being. If someone wanted to connect with you and what you're doing, where should they go? So again, they can go to hoorayhealthcare.com or they can, uh, you know, if you can reach out to me directly on LinkedIn, Shane Foss. And so uh, you can find me really easily there and just send me a, send me a uh, message yeah. for sure. On behalf of the lead to greatness community, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and adding value to us. All right. Thanks, Cedric. Really enjoy it. Thanks for the opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. And don't forget to subscribe to Lead to Greatness if this is your first time. 
and this podcast was helpful to you, leave a big thumbs up. And also, I want you to check out our Marriage Coach Podcast, the podcast with my wife and I. If you're on iTunes, please rate this podcast and leave a review and help get the word out. Again, thank you, Lead to Greatness Nation, for joining us on today. Looking forward to seeing you again on next week. Till then, remember, if you help others reach their greatest potential, together we can change the world. Peace. We out. <laughs>